it was while I was at university that I read Hudson Taylor's biography for the first time. And I read about him having these two scrolls with Chinese characters beside his bed, one of which said Ebenezer and the other Jehovah Jireh. Ebenezer, up to this point, God has provided, and Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. And I recognise that Hudson Taylor, in the peculiar life that he was called to, he had to know for a fact. He had to be able to reflect back on his life and see God had provided so that he could walk into an uncertain future knowing that God would continue to provide. Now actually we all need to know this, don't we? Especially in these uncertain times that we're living in. And, and this is a good time for me to reflect back and look at those Ebenezer stones when God has provided. And I realise now, having lived outside of my home country pretty much for the last 22 years um, and for most of my adult life, I realise that I've had some amazing privileges to, to really learn for myself that God provides. That when God calls, God sustains, God enables, God provides. This was really the lesson that I learned through this Land Rover trip that I went on when I was 22 years old, a year travelling across Africa. Now the idea came to us, three young guys, when we were 19 years old. It was a, in a sense a simple idea but also an outrageous idea. Um, we spent the first few weeks praying about this, getting a sense of personal confirmation. And then in the summer of 1989, the three of us were, were working together as assistants um, in a youth meet, in a series of youth meetings on a summer conference. And we talked about it in that context. Um, and our very first gift came from the teenagers, the kids in this youth tent. They took up a collection. We took it back to our tent where we were sleeping, we counted it up, it was a heavy, a heavy bag of coins. It was around 300 pounds, I think. And I remember we counted this up and it felt really significant that it was a bunch of kids that were giving us this first gift. And when we counted it up and we realised how much money we had, we realised the trip was on. We were going to do this because the money was beginning to come in. Um, and suddenly an idea was, was becoming reality as we saw God provide through people. That same week, there was a, a man at the conference who at that time was living in Malawi. Interestingly, he was a, a friend of my parents from their years in Nigeria. It's, it's lovely how our, our stories interweave. Um, and we met up with him one day and we talked to him. And, and he was, I think, was the first, probably the first adult outside of our immediate circle of family and friends that we talked to about our idea. We, we told him what we were thinking. We asked his opinion because he was someone who lived in Africa and travelled widely. Um, what we didn't know is that that night he was actually speaking in the, the large adults meeting. Um, he was speaking about his life in Malawi. He was speaking about a life of faith. He actually talked about us um, and our idea in his, in his message. He just briefly mentioned it. Um, that was the first time it was kind of spoken about publicly. Now what we didn't know at that point was that in the meeting that night there was an elderly couple who were just in the middle of retiring from their jobs. Um, and in, in the way of, of divine coincidence, this couple lived in a town nine miles away from where I was going to spend the next three years at university. And I was going to end up going to their church. So probably a month after this summer conference, I was visiting that church for the first time. This elderly couple invited me home for lunch and they asked me all about this, this Land Rover trip, which at this stage is, is very much in the vision part. It's not yet becoming reality, um, but I'm sharing the vision with them. I'm talking about our ideas and halfway through the conversation, the chap looked at me and he said, so how much do you think a new Land Rover would cost? Now we'd done a little bit of research, but we didn't know exactly. So I said, I think about 15,000 pounds. He looked back at me and smiled and said, okay, we'll give you that. We'll give you that. Amazing. This was literally the first gift after that small collection from the teenagers. And it was enough money to buy a Land Rover. The money was, was tied up in property and it took, actually in the event, it took two years for the property to sell. So the money didn't come but the, the promise was there. So it was like from the very first start, from the very first moment, our initial idea had been shared, there was confirmation. This was an idea that was coming from God and, and people heard it and, and they wanted to support it. 
It was amazing. It blew our minds. And, and I guess in our initial enthusiasm, we imagined all of the money was going to come in immediately and it was going to be easy. And we even talked about what if, what if we've got the Land Rovers in a year's time and, and should we do it early? Should we take a year out in the middle of university? We had these kind of ambitious ideas, but we realised as, as time went on that it wasn't as easy as all that. A year went past, two years went past, and at the end of two years, we still hadn't received this promised money. In fact, after two years, I think we'd received around three and a half thousand pounds, which was a lot of money, but it wasn't enough to buy two Land Rovers. Those two years went by with a lot of busyness. I got involved in university, I was doing my degree, I was part of the Christian Union, I was travelling, I was doing outreaches, I went to Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Tunisia, I was, I was learning, I was growing, my character was growing. I was learning about prayer, I was fasting, we were, we were talking, we were taking every opportunity we could to plan. After two years, we felt we needed to do something proactive. We did a, a Land's End to John O'Groats, 1,100 mile sponsored cycle ride. We cycled the entire length of the United Kingdom. It was fantastic. Eight guys and a minibus on our bikes, three weeks of cycling, it was great fun. We were given around, I think, 8,000 pounds as a result of that cycle. And then the money from the house sale came through and with a year to go, around 25,000 pounds had come into our bank account. Suddenly the money was there. We had enough, we thought, to at least start. Interestingly, at that point, with a year to go, this is when, I guess, allies really stepped in. Our pastor, my pastor at that point, who was, was a wonderful ally, um, was speaking about our idea to someone he knew in another company who happened to know someone in Land Rover. So he said he would talk to this marketing director of Land Rover on our behalf. He spoke to him, talked about the project, and this man, I'll call him Jim, Jim got in touch with our pastor. And Jim said, I'm interested in this, can we meet? So the three of us, with my pastor, the four of us, went and met with Jim in Solihull at the Land Rover factory. There's me, at this point, I was just about to start this cycle ride, I had a big bushy beard. I didn't even have a jacket and tie. I had to borrow a jacket from the pastor. It was too small for me. I must have looked a real mess. <laughs> 20 years old, naive. We go into the Land Rover factory. We meet with Jim. There's photos of the royal family up around the, the room. He's, he's the man who deals with royalty. And we're there in his office. He asks how much we've raised so far. And I think at that point it was around 23,000. So we said, about 23,000 pounds. And he said, fantastic. That seems enough to go on with. And that was the end of our meeting. He talked about the kind of vehicles we were looking for, and he left us with this sense that he was going to do something, but there was nothing in writing. He'd said, that sounds like enough to go on with type of thing. But we didn't know what that meant exactly. We returned to our final year at university, and the months began to go past. We still didn't hear back from Jim. We believed. We didn't know, though. Interestingly, one of the things he gave us during our time, he gave us lots of catalogues, he gave us lots of Land Rover publicity, but he also gave us a small pewter model of a Land Rover. And it sat on the, the mantelpiece in someone's house in the church. And we often looked at that Land Rover as we were praying. And it was like the, the first small sign of something good that was coming. And I remember at the time, one of us read a Lilius Trotter book. And in this, she said, um, that in the Sahara, when you see a trickle of water, you know a stream is nearby. When you see a palm tree, you know an oasis is nearby. And somehow that, that pewter Land Rover was the trickle of water that was an encouragement to us, that a stream was nearby, that it was coming. And as we prayed, we knew that somehow Jim was, was an ally that God had given us and, and we could depend on him. And, and something was going to happen, we didn't know what. But at the same time, the months are going past, we know that, that our time to depart is coming up. We were planning to leave in the summer of 1992, and it's coming up to Easter of 1992. We've still got £25,000 and no vehicles. We know it's going to cost a lot more than that. So we begin to think, what do we do? We're getting advice from different people. Some people are saying Africa is so unsafe at the moment, you should ship the Land Rovers. You should ship them down to Durban in South Africa. If we did that, we would have saved a lot of money on fuel. And, and we're thinking maybe that's what we should do. 
Other people were saying, there's a really good, reputable Land Rover dealer here. Why don't you go to them and, and find second-hand vehicles? And we were thinking, maybe that's something we should do. In fact, in April of 1992, we actually spent an hour talking to a dealer, working out how much we needed for two second-hand Land Rovers. And we were just at this point of, of maybe that's what we need to do. Fortunately, fortunately, we didn't go down that route. And then suddenly, Jim called us up and he said, I've got your Land Rovers, come in. This is in April now of 1992. We went into the Land Rover Solihull office, the factory. We met up with Jim and his assistants and he took us down into a back part of the factory and there were two Land Rovers there parked next to another couple of vehicles, Camel Land Rovers. Um, but the two Land Rovers in question, white Land Rover Defenders, they were all kitted out for off-road travel and they'd been They'd been put together, especially for a Paris to Beijing rally, which had been cancelled. Jim is looking at these vehicles and he's talking to his, his sidekicks who are there with him. And he, he looked at the camel vehicle, which is nearby, and he said, oh, that one's got a winch. Why don't you take the winch off that one and, and put it on one of these ones? And look, look, take those, take those roof racks off the camel vehicles and put them on these two. So even while we're standing there, he's, he's kitting these vehicles out even better for us. And we sat with him in his office afterwards and he agreed that these two Land Rovers would cost us £25,000 and they were worth well in excess of £40,000. April passed, we move into May. Other people began to give in amazing ways. Someone else who was also a friend of our pastors said he had some spare parts for us. He put together a box, £4,000 worth of spare parts. Someone else gave fuel jerry cans, someone else gave water jerry cans, other people gave CD radios, someone gave a shortwave radio, someone gave a tent and all this equipment was beginning to come in and we were seeing God's provision in amazing ways. And then finally the day came for the Land Rovers to come and then, then we suddenly realised at the last minute that we needed to pay VAT. We had £25,000 set aside for the vehicles. But the VAT on £25,000 was almost £5,000. We had to pay VAT. This wasn't in our minds. This, was, this was, wasn't something that Land Rover could just write off. This was the tax man. And suddenly, with just weeks to go, we were thrown into this kind of emergency. Where do we come up with £5,000 to pay that? We're praying. Should we borrow the money? Different people began to offer to lend us the money. Should we borrow money to pay the tax? But actually this didn't feel right and we're praying again, we're praying for a miracle. God, we need a miracle. And then again, a friend of our pastors who was a Christian lawyer heard about this and he said, let, let me see if I can do anything. He talked to Land Rover, he talked to the people in the tax office and somehow between them, and I don't even to this day know how they did this, they managed to write off the VAT. And the miracle was given. We weren't paying VAT. And the Land Rovers, we picked them up in July 1992 a friend who was a sign writer offered to make some nice stickers that would go on the side of the vehicle. We had a beautiful map of Africa with a Land Rover in the middle and above it said Young Christians for Africa. And then on the, the front wheel on the hub of one Land Rover it said Joshua and on the hub of the other Land Rover it said Caleb. The two spies who made it into the promised land. And, and it really felt for us that, that once we had the vehicles it was almost like the, the trip was done. It was like the vision had come to reality. We had these two vehicles that we'd entered the promised land, if you like. We'd seen God's provision. We had managed somehow to hold on through difficult times and we'd seen God provide. I realized as well during that time that, especially in those two years when nothing much was happening and we had a promise which hadn't yet become reality, I realized that, that actually the work that God was doing was internal. God was working in us. Faithfulness in little things is a little thing, but faithfulness in little things is everything. I read that in Hudson Taylor as well, and, and I learned that at the time, that just being faithful in little things was so important, and that as I'm faithful in little things, God can entrust bigger things. And that actually, when we were 19, we weren't ready for this big thing. It was like God needed to shape us and prepare us. And I also learned that a God-given dream or vision is something that inspires passion in his people. 
on our vision, which was a God-given dream, actually inspired passion not only in us but in people around us. And because it inspired passion, for example, in these other young people who gave so generously, it actually gave us influence. And influence is leadership. You don't need a position to be a leader. As soon as you've got influence in other people's lives, you're leading. And if you're leading, you need to take that responsibly. And that was something else we learned in that time, was that in a sense, this, this dream, even though it was just a dream, it opened doors. It gave us influence. It gave us opportunities to speak in churches, to speak in Christian unions, to speak in conferences, to speak in youth camps, youth meetings, schools, assemblies, religious education lessons. We, we took every opportunity we could to talk about what we were doing and to talk about God's provision. And I realized at the time that in a sense, we were, we were riding a wave that wasn't of our making. This wave was kind of building up. There was a, a swelling up. And, and it was an opportunity which may not come again. And we were making the most of it. And God, in his faithfulness, was, was so good. People were so generous. People were unbelievably generous in, in giving sacrificially. And I learned through this that God really is faithful, that God does provide. And so I, I honestly can say that when I was 22 years old, I, I could really say, here I raise my Ebenezer, like the line in that, that hymn, come thou founds of every blessing. Here I raise my Ebenezer. I know that up to this point, God really has provided. And so as I go into an uncertain future, as we go into this uncertain future, in these strange days we're living in, we know that because God has provided in the past, God will continue to provide in the future.